Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm here with Dr. Jerome Kagan. He is Professor of Psychology Emeritus at Harvard University. Professor Kagan's research focuses on the origins of temperament. He has tracked the development of inhibited and uninhibited children from infancy to adolescence. He has served on the National Institute of Mental Health and on the National Research Council. His books include A Gallant's Prophecy, Temperament in Human Nature, Three Seductive Ideas, and others. So, Dr. Kagan, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a real honor to talk to you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, great. So, my first question would be, uh, what is temperament? Uh, the answer is not simple mm -hmm. because temperament is an abstract term and therefore there's not agreement among scientists as to what it is. And that is because it depends on how you measure it. Do you actually observe young infants or... Do you ask parents to describe their infants? Or do you give questionnaires to adults and ask them to describe certain traits? So those are three different definitions. The second problem is infants differ in the first week of life. They differ in how irritable they are, how easy they are to soothe, how much energy they have, how much they cry, and so on. Now, because we're in the first week, we assume that these differences are not due to what the child experienced, but are due to biology. But the biology of the infant could be inherited or due to conditions in the uterus when the fetus was developing. So now you can see, Ricardo, that we have very, we have many definitions. So I'm now going to talk about the definition that I favor, and for the rest of this interview, that is the definition we're going to use for temperament, even okay. though it's not the one that everybody agrees to. So here's my definition. Infants differ in the concentration, infants differ for genetic reasons because of genes in the concentrations of many molecules that affect brain function as well as the receptors that these molecules contact. That is a very large number of combinations and that means that there will be millions of different combinations and even if only half of them contributed to a temperamental bias, we still have a large number of temperamental biases that infants possess when they're born due to their genes. And I call those temperamental biases. So that's my definition of a temperamental bias, of which there are many, but many respected scientists have different definitions of temperament. So is that answer clear? Mm -hmm. I think it is clear, but let me just ask you a couple of follow-up questions. At a certain point there, you refer to the fact that um, we can already sort of describe the temperament of a particular child uh, in the first week after it's born. So is it possible to talk about temperament from from the beginning of the child's life? I mean, immediately after it's born or not? Yes. Yes, because on the first day of life, if you had a hundred infants, they would be different in their behavior. So yes, those are temperamental biases. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, what are some of the limitations in studying temperament? You refer to the fact that uh, we can observe uh, the child's behavior, we can resort to the reports by their family members, for example, or their teachers and professors. So, uh, I, I mean, there are essentially limitations with studying temperament because we are always or we have to rely on observational limitations by uh, researchers or other people related to that particular child, correct? Yeah, here's the problem. Mm -hmm. That as of this date, October 23rd, 2019, most of the research on temperament is based on what parents report on a questionnaire okay. and in my opinion that's inadequate because parents don't observe things that are relevant and in addition parents vary in how perceptive they are some parents are not very perceptive of their infants and so forth they they are poor reporters of their infants temperaments so even though most of the research on temperament is based on what parents say, usually the mother, not the father. In my view, this is too crude, too coarse a measure of temperament. And you have to do observations. But the number of studies that use observations is very small. Mm -hmm. You refer to temperamental biases. and That's what you... they are. Mm -hmm. And you basically said that there should be a huge number of temperamental biases because they derive from how the brain is structured and organized and how it functions and that depends on the genes of the particular person. Uh, but are there any temperamental traits that you have studied that you can point to? Yes, that question relates to my research because my colleagues and I studied only two mm -hmm. of the many temperamental biases and we studied these because they're more obvious. Now remember, these are only two yes. and they are defined by how the infant reacts to an event that it does not expect, a surprising event such as someone suddenly enters the room that the baby doesn't know, or a new taste is introduced into the infant's mouth, or it hears an unfamiliar noise. How does that infant react? Does it cry? Does it become upset? Or is it calm? And we call the first infant high reactive, and we call the infant who does not show much disturbance low reactive. Those are two different temperamental biases that my group has studied for 40 years, but they are, because they're easy to observe, but that doesn't mean that they are, the, they are not the only temperaments, and they might not be the most important, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And by studying these temperamental traits, uh, like reactivity, high or low reactivity in this case, uh, at early stages of development, is it possible for us to predict how that particular child will develop in the future and the kinds of, for example, personality traits that it will exhibit in later stages of development? Yes, fortunately, I can answer that question. Mm -hmm. You can't predict their behavior very well because all the experiences they have between the first few months of life and when they're 20 years old shape their behavior, right. what Jung called their persona. And so you can't predict their behavior very well. But their private feelings... Now, let me tell you what I mean. Humans differ 
if they if humans reflect on how tense, vigilant, uh, anxious they feel inside, even though they may not show it, that trait is more likely to be preserved among high reactives than low reactives. Low reactives, when they're 20 years old, tend to report a feeling of being relaxed, not very tense, and not very anxious. So you can predict how they will feel inside, what Jung called their anima, but you can't predict their behavior very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and you talked about how they feel in the inside. I guess that it would be important at this point to introduce the distinction between feelings and emotions. Uh, could you tell us about that? Yes. Uh, your feelings, your private feelings, are sensations like tastes or smells, and they originate in your in the activity of your heart, your gut, and your muscles. That activity is transmitted to the brain, and from it emerges a feeling. If any of the listeners to this interview stopped and reflected on how they feel, they would report different feelings. Now, emotions are words that humans interpret. That The emotions are the words they use to interpret how they feel. So, for example, you wake up in the morning and you feel very tense. That's a feeling. And you say to yourself, why am I tense? I'm usually not tense in the morning. And then you think about why you're tense. Is it because you got a lot of work to do that day? Is it because uh, you know you have to take care of a, of a loved one who has to go to the hospital? Is it because you'd lost your job the previous day? Is it because you think something bad is going to happen? And depending on your interpretation, you would report different feelings, whether you say, I'm anxious, or you say, you know, I'm uncertain, or I'm angry. Those are emotions. Emotions are words used to interpret feelings. And this is a big under misunderstanding in current day psychology because psychologists equate the emotional words as if they were feelings. They are not. They are interpretations of your feelings. Now, no one is going to misinterpret tension and vigilance as sexual arousal. So you don't make a lot of big errors. And no one is going to confuse a feeling of relaxation with a feeling of anger. So some interpretations don't happen, but there's still a lot of variation among people who have the same feeling, but impose a different interpretation on it. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, and so what is exactly the relationship between temperament and feelings? Well, for the temperaments we studied, the infants we call high reactive are more likely for the next 20, 30 years to have feelings of tension, vigilance, and uncertainty. And low reactives are more likely to have feelings of being relaxed and not very tense. But can we talk about the causal relationship between no. temperament and feelings? No, no, you don't understand. Okay. Temperament, the temperamental biases I'm talking about are due to genes, and no, we do not understand as of this day what those genes are. So we don't know the origins of high or low reactivity biases. We, we don't know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, and what about, uh, for example, moods? Is there any relationship between temperament and a particular mood that a yeah. particular person experiences or not? Well, that's a good question uh, because that allows me to make a differentiation between acute emotions which last a few minutes or a few seconds, right? You're not angry forever. So yeah. an anger that lasts an hour is called an acute emotion. An anger that lasts for months is called a mood. So a mood is a chronic emotion instead of a an acute short-term one. That's what a mood is. So, yes, high reactives would be more likely to have moods of tension and vigilance. A mood is just an emotional interpretation that lasts a long time. Mm -hmm. And is there also any relationship between temperament and what we call uh, world views, like pessimism, optimism, yeah, and sure. other yeah. questions related to views of life? Yeah, the relationship is not strong, but yes, it is probably true that a high reactive temperamental bias, a person, an infant with a high reactive temperamental bias is a little more likely to be a pessimist than an optimist, sure. Not, I mean, the relationship is not big, but it, it's small, but probably significant, yes. Mm -hmm. Do we know if and to what extent temperament is influenced by people like uh, family and peers? Oh, well, no, here's what you have to understand. You're born with a temperamental bias. Mm -hmm. Let's say a temperamental bias to be relaxed, okay. low reactive, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, your experiences will determine how that temperament turns out. So I'll give you two extreme examples. Okay. I have two low reactive boys. They're born with a low reactive temperamental bias. I put one, one boy is born into a middle class family. The mother is a lawyer. The father's a doctor. They're both very loving. The child goes to good schools. And what happens? This boy, as an adult, turns out to be a governor, a senator, a trial lawyer, has a very successful life. Now, I'm going to take that same boy with the same temperament, and I'm going to put him in a poor family that's a member of a minority, mm -hmm. and he's raised in a slum in a neighborhood that's full of crime, and this boy, because he's not, because his temperament does not lead him to be very fearful, he joins a gang, and they commit an armed robbery, and this boy, as an adult, is in prison. These two boys were born with exactly the same temperament, but because of their family and the friends they made, they live very different lives. Mm -hmm. I understand. So it's not really that we can't predict um, how people uh, how people will will feel in the future in terms of no, their no. subjective. No, you can predict. No, you can predict how they feel. You can't predict their behavior mm -hmm. or their yeah. life course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. And can we say? Is it correct to say that temperament is innate? Is in well, innate is a innate used to be a popular word. Mm -hmm. No one uses it anymore. What innate means is it has a genetic contribution. That's all it means. Mm -hmm. And is uh, do we know of any way by which people can willingly change their temperament? I mean, is that even possible? No, you can't change your genes, except. Mm -hmm except 
Now, this is really important. Mm -hmm. The last 10 years, geneticists have discovered the importance of epigenetics, especially this fact that your life experiences, which include your diet, your exercise, what happens to you, that can change whether the gene will be expressed. So let me make up a hypothetical example, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's take a high reactive infant, and let's say we knew, which we don't, that genes one, one, two, three, four are the genes that are causing high reactivity. Genes one, two, three, four. But they've got to be expressed. Now, your life experiences can lead those genes to be silenced by epigenetic mechanisms. Mm -hmm. It's too technical to describe what those are, but there are many experiences can alter the expression of a gene. So I have a high reactive infant, Mary, and Mary's life experiences are such that she undergoes epigenetic changes that that quiet the expression of the genes that made her tense. So now she's feeling less tense. So in that sense, yes, you can alter your temperamental bias by epigenetic changes in your genes. That is one of the biggest discoveries of the last 10 or 15 years. But can people do that willingly? No. Or, no, or does that happen no. just because they are exposed to different experiences in life? The latter. You can't will it. No, you can't control it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only way you can control it is to... This is the extent to which you can control it. You can eat the best diet you can. You can exercise. You can try to avoid excessive stress. That's about it. If you do that, then you do increase the probability that you'll have epigenetic changes that are benevolent. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, even those kinds of things certainly depend on the level of control that people can have over their own behavior, correct? Oh, your behavior you can control. Mm -hmm. Willie, oh, we have control of our behaviors, right? I can decide whether to inhibit an insult. I can decide whether to take a risk. I can decide whether to, uh, you know, make this friend or not. Our behavior we're in control of, but we're not in control of our genes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. And is there any relationship between temperament and what we call personality traits? Okay. Now, personality mm -hmm. is a very amorphous word. Okay. Here's what it means. It means, what are the traits, the behavioral traits, that are, that are most important in differentiating on people in a particular society at a particular time. So let's go back. Let's go back to medieval Europe mm -hmm. before the Reformation. Well, when, when the vast majority were Catholic and, and the variation in religious piety was a very important trait that differentiated among people because remember, there were also non-Catholics, right? There were right. Muslims, there were Jews, there were Baha'i. Mm -hmm. So if we made a personality test in the year 1100, piety would be a personality trait because it was a salient difference among humans in 1100. Piety is not a personality trait in, Portugal, in Western Europe or, Europe or North America today because it, it's not that important. You see what I mean? So now what happens over time is 
we change the traits that we call personality. Personality doesn't have a stable definition. It depends on what traits are salient for that culture at that time. So now we come to the 20th century, and in the 20th century, in in developed nations like Western Europe and North America, what traits are salient that are important to adaptation? They are, are you an agreeable person? Are you a conscientious person? Are you an anxious person? Are you open to new ideas? And notice, those are the personality traits of the 20th century, and that's what personality tests measure. And I'll tell you something, in 200 years, those will not be the personality traits because because the values, the nation of the cultures are going to change. Is that clear? Mm-hmm. That so personality, we... personality doesn't have a fixed definition the tr- because it refers to the traits that are important in that society at that time. Okay, I understand. So would it be correct to say that personality or personality traits are highly influenced by the cultural context where people live? Yes. Mm-hmm. And But given a particular cultural context, is it the case that temperament would influence the kinds of personality traits that a particular person develops or not? Yes, yes. Let's take the popular traits today. Agreeableness, conscientiousness, open to new ideas, a high reactive a person with a high reactive temperament is a little more likely to be conscientious. So they'd be high on the trait for conscientiousness because they don't want to make a mistake. They don't want to be criticized because that makes them very anxious. While a low reactive doesn't care very much. So yes, temperament can make a contribution to some personality traits, but not all. I suspect that Temperament makes little contribution to the trait called openness to new ideas, which is one of the big five personality traits. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, So let me now change topics a little bit, because I wanted to ask you, um, you wrote a book back in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken, about the second year of life of infants. And you put a lot of emphasis on that era of development because as far as I understand it, uh, it is where uh, children develop certain cognitive traits that uh, distinguish them even also from other primates, right? Yes. Could you tell us about that? Yes. Up to about... Up to about age... 14, 15 months, uh, chimpanzees and humans are very similar. Mm -hmm. But beginning in the middle of the second year, because of the greater connectivity of the human brain and the fact that there were many, many, many more neurons in a human brain than in a chimp brain, certain connections are made in the middle of the second year that allow humans to develop four properties. And these four properties do not exist in any primate other than human. And here they are, I'm going to list them. One, the ability to infer the thoughts and feelings of many different people. Apes can make some inferences about what another ape is seeing, S-E-E-I-N-G, but they can't make many other inferences. That's about the only one they can make with reliably. But you, but two-year-olds infer whether, whether if they see an adult coming with holding many packages, the two-year-old will open the door because they'll infer that they can't open the door holding the packages. No chimpanzee would ever do that. So inference is the most important, a broad ability to infer thoughts and feelings of others. 
because of that, that allows language, that helps language, because when a mother says, oh, Mary, look, look at the blue ball, the child infers that the mother intends the word blue ball to refer to the object Mary is seeing, and that helps symbolic language to appear, which no chimpanzee has. So that's the second important trait, the emergence of a symbolic language that allows a child to comprehend and, and learn words for experiences. So that's very important. The mm-hmm. third is one of the most distinctive human traits that no chimpanzee has, and that is to divide, to understand that there are good and bad things, right and wrong actions. And this is what we call morality. And the very first philosophers, uh, Plato, Aristotle, others, recognized that a conscience, an understanding of right and wrong, is fundamental to human. Even a criminal who kills understands that this act is wrong. He may not feel guilty, but he understands that he is doing a ethically wrong act. And so a symbolic language and a conscience are distinctly human and two of the most important traits that distinguish humans from every other animal. And the final trait, which I believe is human, although those who study animals would disagree, and that is an awareness of self, what we call consciousness, which does not emerge until the second year. A two-month-old infant is not conscious. A two-month-old infant may feel pain, but they're not conscious of the pain, if you understand what I mean, that they understand that it's me, me, Jerome Kagan, who's feeling uh, that I, as a person, is experiencing that. We call that self-consciousness, and that emerges in the second year. So those are the four distinctly human traits, inference, language, a morality, a conscience, and finally, self-consciousness. And those four traits together make humans a distinctive species. And, it, and that has to be in our genes, and it's due to connections that are made in the second year of life. Mm-hmm. Uh, about the first trait, inference, that's yes. also what we call theory of mind, correct? Theory of mind Invo- requires inference, yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, inference is one component of theory. No, no, of no, mind. the other way around. Oh, okay. Usually, the investigators who study theory of mind only give one test, you know, the, the test where people change the location of an object. That mm-hmm. only requires one kind of inference. Inference applies to many, many things other than that one procedure that scientists use to talk about theory of mind. And that one procedure doesn't measure everything about theory of mind. I mean, it's silly to give one procedure and say, if a baby, if a two-year-old can pass that, they must have a theory of mind. A -hmm. two-year-old could pass that test and yet still be unable to make many inferences about others. That's what theory of mind means. Theory of mind means... I can infer what you're thinking or the question you might ask in the next few seconds. A two-year-old can't do that even though he could pass the test that we that the investigators call theory of mind. Mm-hmm. And in terms of these four traits that emerge during the second year of life and that you say are genetic, because they are genetic, Uh, Are you also interested in understanding uh, their evolutionary history, like, for example, the kinds of evolutionary pressures that we went through and that gave rise to these four traits, or not? Well, that's a very good question, Ricardo, but I can speculate. (laughs) You know, many 
many eminent scientists have suggested that because humans had to cooperate in groups, that the ability to infer the mind of another would be very important. I mean, here are eight men going out to hunt for food with bows and arrows. Yes, it would be important if you and I were going out on a hunting trip that that we each be able to infer what you and I were thinking because then we would cooperate better. So most, most scientists, as you know, have emphasized the importance of cooperate, that humans have to cooperate. Yes. While that is less important in gorillas uh, or even in gibbons, which are primates. So I suspect that that's right. But I'm not sure what happened first. Most investigators say the need to cooperate led to the selection of inference. And my own opinion is it's just the opposite. That the ability to infer the mind of another, that led to cooperation. But that's a speculation. Mm -hmm. So because we don't have direct access to our evolutionary past, some of these questions are uh, chicken and egg problems, right? Because oh, yeah. We don't know what came first. We don't, even though, as you know, a majority think that cooperation came first. Mm -hmm. yes. but, but, you, but, but then you have to ask, well, why did we cooperate? How could, we, how could I cooperate with you if I can't infer what you're thinking? That's impossible, right? I can't cooperate. If you and I have a joint task, how could I cooperate if I don't infer what it is we're trying to do and what you're thinking? That's why I say I think inference came first. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand. I understand the problem there. Uh, so, in this latter part of the interview, and perhaps this will be my last question, but let's see. Just going back to the question I made before about the distinction between uh, feelings and emotions. If I understood your answer correctly, you said that emotions are the words that we, that we use to interpret our feelings. Yes. So, would you say then that the fact that we use certain words to associate with the feelings that we experience, that, that, uh, that by itself might contaminate how people do research uh, about feelings? Absolutely. And I have criticized that in my writings that what many investigators do is they ask about emotions. They ask a questionnaire and they say, you know, how often are you fearful? <laughs> but that's an interpretation. Right. Uh, here, let's do an example. Mm -hmm. When this interview is over and I decide to leave my study, I go to the door, which is closed, and I can't open it. Now, notice what's going to happen. I'm going to have a very strong feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, my, what will be my initial interpretation? It'll be anxiety, right? Why? Why is this door locked? But in a few seconds, I'm going to... I'm going to change my interpretation, I'm going to, I'm going to get angry because I'm going to say, damn it, somebody locked the door. Why did they do that? The feeling hasn't changed, but my interpretation has changed. There's a beautiful example of going from fear to anger for the same feeling, depending upon how I interpret my feeling of arousal that my door is locked. Mm -hmm. but, so, the problem, but the problem is, yeah. that humans don't have many words for feelings. Now, there's a reason for that, because feelings, because the place where feelings originate don't have strong connections with the left temporal lobe where words are. That's because of the way the brain is organized. So we have a problem 
that we have many words for feelings, but we don't have many words for, I'm sorry, we have many words for emotions. We don't have many words for feelings. So it's hard to ask. I mean, if you, if you introspected right now and I said, Ricardo, tell me how you're feeling. You wouldn't have many words. It's like for smell. You'll notice we don't have words for smell. If I gave you the smell of a banana, and I said, tell me, Ricardo, what is the smell? Well, you would say it smells like a banana. You don't have a word for that smell. So smells are like feelings because, because the olfactory cortex and the, the place where feelings originate don't have strong connections to the language sites of the human brain. So that's why the questionnaires ask about emotions and don't ask about feelings. Mm -hmm. I understand. And so, since we don't have direct access to other people's minds, what would be some more objective way to understand how feelings work? Would we have to resort to perhaps neuroscientific approaches or something like that? Uh, that's a very good question. Most investigators say the only way is to study the brain function in a certain situation that should arouse a feeling. The problem with that is that it probably involves many, many sites in the brain and neuroscientists don't understand how to interpret if you use fMRI, interpret the sites that are activated. So at the moment, neuroscience approaches have not been too helpful in un, to helping us understand the feeling a person interprets. Because too often there's a dissociation between what the person feels consciously, which is a psychological outcome, and what's happening in the brain. That's where we are at present. Now, we're at a primitive state, and, and it'll get better in the future. I feel that in 50 years, the study of the brain will be more helpful in telling us what feeling the person has. But it's never going to predict it 100%, because as you pass from a brain state to a psychological state, which is the consciousness of a feeling, you lose a little predictability because you're changing phases. You're, you're changing to a new vocabulary. The second is we have to devise better psychological measures for feelings. You can't ask people, and a lot of people are, more investigators should be working on that, like matching colors to feelings, matching uh, matching. Uh, smells and tastes of feelings instead of asking about them. And I think by using these new modalities, future investigators will be able to use some psychological measures, which they're not doing now. Mm -hmm. So maybe trying to create scales that would be based on things that yeah, are but, not yeah. words, because words are very limited. Yeah. Yeah, for example, let me give you an example. Okay. Suppose I bring a person into a laboratory, and if the Institutional Review Board approves, I try to make them very fearful by bringing a caged cobra snake close to them. That should make most people a little afraid, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to know how they're feeling. So I give them a little lever from low to high, and I say, okay, here's a sound. Tell me how loud that sound is, and then they move it, either from it's not very loud to very loud. And then I give them a smell that varies in intensity, and they do the same. And then I give them a taste. You see what I'm doing? And I, I combine these to see if I can infer what the intensity of their feeling is. Is that clear? 
Mm-hmm. Yes, it's clear. Uh, even though maybe, I mean, it's a bit hard to understand uh, in what ways we would be able to gain access to the what we call the subjective experience itself. That's very hard. Right. Mm-hmm. We're, we're a long way from that. Mm-hmm. And uh, because okay, so, yes, go please go ahead. Yeah. No, no, go on. Yeah. I, I was just going to ask you one last question that is since the words that we use and the way we interpret our feelings somewhat depend on those words and how we think about right. them then it's also the case that the way we interpret our feelings also influences how we deal with the things that produce those same feelings. Or for, right. For example, in English, there's only, there's only the word afraid or fearful. And so we say, look, that infant is afraid. Look, that adolescent is afraid. Look, that adult seems afraid. In Japanese... You don't use the same word for an infant. If an infant cries to a stranger, you use a word very different when an adult seems to be afraid of a snake. So English is the worst language to talk about emotions because it doesn't differentiate among who it is and what they're afraid of. Most languages, especially Far Eastern languages like Mandarin and Japanese, They have different words. And so, unfortunately, most of the research on emotions is done by English speakers writing in English for English journals. And if if the Japanese were interested in studying emotions and they wrote in Japanese for Japanese journals, it would be much better. English is a bad language for doing science. So uh, I guess that's one of the reasons why there is an entire branch in cultural psychology that is interested in understanding the kinds of emotions that people right. experience in other cultures. Right. 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 For example, many years ago, uh, and a psychologist named Charles Osgood wrote a book called The Measurement of Meaning in which he uh, gave subjects from many, many different cultures a large list of nouns like mother, father, duck, apple, pig. And then you had to rate those, each noun on 20 antonyms, like good, bad, active, passive, pretty, ugly. You got it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Among English-speaking cultures, the first three factors were good versus bad, potent versus impotent, and active versus passive. But in some cultures, the difference between pretty and ugly emerged as a factor, but not in English speakers, so that the antonyms that are salient in your, in your emotional life vary across cultures. Mm-hmm. I Remember, I brought that up when I talked about piety as being a personality trait in medieval Portugal, but not today. Mm-hmm. Okay, so would you say then that maybe the Portuguese people uh, over the last few centuries have lost one emotion in that case? or? Well, I would say the the words they use for emotions have changed over the last 500 years, absolutely. If we could go back to 1500 and we asked people to describe their emotions, they would use different words than they use today. And and if a personality test were given, they would show very different personalities than they do today. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. So, Dr. Kagan, let's end the interview here. Uh, Before we go, would you like to leave any final remarks about the things that we've been talking about, like temperament or others? Because I might have left some important 
topics out. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I would just say one more thing. Okay. In order for psychology to make more rapid progress, it has to measure more than one variable. In other words, you have to measure multiple predictors and multiple outcomes. That is not the case. If you read, read most journals, most psychologists study a single predictor and a single outcome. Mm -hmm. But every outcome can be preceded by more than one cascade of processes. And therefore, you don't know what that outcome means unless you study patterns of measures in, and this is my second and last point, patterns of measures in people who vary in their age, infants, children, old people, gender, male or female, social class, poor or affluent, and ethnicity. Are you white, black, Asian, or, La or Latin America? You've got to study those four groups because the meaning of events often varies as a function of those four categories. And social scientists don't do that. And those are the only two points I would want to add. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's end on that note, Dr. Kagan. And again, it was really a pleasure to talk to you and to have you on the show. So thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Of those four categories. And social scientists don't do that. And those are the only two points I would want to add. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's end on that note, Dr. Kagan. And again, it was really a pleasure to talk to you and to have you on the show. So thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, you can also support me via Subscribestar or Paypal. And please share the video, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Iane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervois, and Bo Weingart, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.